All right. So our next talk is Ram here, and he's going to speak about a framework to quantitatively assess AI safety, which includes challenges, open questions, and opportunities. So give it up for him, and I'm going to let him take it away. Thank you. Uh, so a uh, quick show of hands. How many of you uh, are currently using machine learning in, as part of your product, or your company wants you to? OK, perfect. How many of you want to? OK. Sweet. OK, so that's, that's great. Um, you know, let's go back to a little bit of early 90s. The internet is just starting out. You know, things are fine. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, we see a spate of cyber attacks. Like, you know, and I don't have to explain this to you guys. Um, and then what happened was the regulatory landscape kind of quickly changed. You know, federal law started coming into place. Like, you know, uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act Apparently, Reagan saw the War Games movies, got really inspired, and you know, uh, within like a couple of years, this act was formed. Uh, hopefully, people are now watching Mr. Robot, and we get like stronger acts like that. State laws started uh, cropping up to fill in the gaps. Anybody wants to take a wild guess which was the first state to actually make ransomware illegal? Wisconsin. Uh, you're in the right track. Closer. It starts with a W. Oh my gosh, you're right, Wyoming. Yeah, Wyoming, interesting enough, is the first state, I think in 2015, legislated ransomware is illegal. And we have like a spate of like standardized cybersecurity frameworks. If you are a company and you want to convince your customers that your system is secure, you would adopt one of these frameworks. And that's how you would convince your customers that, hey, I pass all these controls and this is pretty much, I'm a secure system. Let's kind of shift to like machine learning today. Uh, this is like uh, the machine learning landscape by Siobhan Zillis, a uh, venture capitalist at Bloomberg Beta. If you can't see anything, which I'm sure you can, um, a lot of companies out there who are actually investing in machine learning as the core value proposition. Um, and the interesting thing is, the attacks on machine learning has now grown at an exponential rate. Archive, which kind of documents how many, you know, the, uh, uh, it's a public repository of documents, has close to like 100 papers on adversarial machine learning just in the past two years. And this is kind of like a timeline. Um, sorry you can't see it, but I've, I know I'll tweet the slides out, by Batista Biggio, kind of like mapping out extensively like what are the different attacks that are possible, um, you know, starting all the way back from 20, uh, 2004. But today, our regulatory rent landscape with respect to machine learning looks pretty empty. You know, there's no way, there's no guidance from the government. There's no guidance from standards organizations to tell you which ML algorithm is safe. Uh, and this kind of is a problem because uh, we've now all bought into this Kool-Aid of machine learning, and we have no way to tell our customers, hey, what I'm doing is safe from a machine learning perspective. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, you know, my name is Ram. I work in the Azure Security Data Science team. Our promise to customers is, you know, we'll keep Azure and you secure. Um, and this is this work is done um, uh, as uh, I'm also a research fellow at uh, Berkman Client Center, and this is what I'm going to be working on there. So a lot of this is ongoing work. So it's rough around the edges, and if you're working on this uh, area, I'd love to learn, talk to you more about. And this part, and this talk basically has two parts. So the first half is going to be about how do I assess the safety rating of a machine learning system? So, you know, your development team, say, you know, let's say that they built a machine learning system, you know, can we pass it through some sort of framework and get a safety rating? Just like, you know, how you would expect of like a, a, the health of a food or, you know, the safety of your car seats, which you can very much look at. What kind of guarantees can you get about the safety of your machine learning system? So that's going to be the, the first half of the talk. The second part is going to be about the legal underpinning of a uh, machine learning system. You know, we all have, we all heard about the doomsday scenario, right? Like there's a drone, you know, using an open source system, and instead of landing in your backyard, what if it kind of like, you know, chops your hand off? What do you do then? Like, who do you who do you sue? Do you sue the drone maker? Do you sue the open source software? What kind of like legal underpinning uh, is there for like machine learning safety? So those are the two things. 
So first of all, like the call for like machine learning safety is not new, um, new-ish. So Urs Gasser, you know, wrote a fantastic paper on AI governance and said, hey, the first thing you want to be tackling is some sort of standard, some sort of data governance with respect to machine learning safety. Ryan Kahlo, who's a robotics professor, uh, who's a law professor at UW, uh, has pretty much laid a lot of open questions uh, on this field and proposing a lot of fantastic ideas. And things are getting real. Um, you know, Europe's AI strategy specifically says by 2019, they're going to come up with a standard framework and a liability framework for ML safety. So things are picking up at a great space. So it's not like I am, all of these are new ideas. I'm building on top of them. So first off, why, do you, why should you care? Like, you know, what is, uh, why is this an important topic for us to discuss at DEF CON? Uh, I think the, the most important thing is we all, we all want to hold our service providers to some accountability. Like you are trust, just like how you trust your data to say the cloud and you assume that the cloud is secure. Uh, if you're going to use a machine learning system, like, you know, uh, you want to know that the machine learning system is secure as well. Um, Kang Lee gave a fantastic talk just like uh, an hour before about the software vulnerabilities that come in, that, that you inherit when you build machine learning systems. Uh, and that's kind of like unacceptable because if you are running a production system, you want your customers to feel safe uh, from that perspective. And from a Regulatory st uh, standpoint, just like you know, if you want to take the cloud as an example, um, you have a bunch of laws that you know, Congress, you know, regulatory agencies, and even councils, independent councils have created. So you know, if you want to host, say, the credit card data, you would have to be PCI compliant. And if you fail, you pretty much get fines. You lose the ability to operate, and you can be criminally prosecuted uh, for this. So hopefully we don't want any of you guys to go to get jail. So the first half is going to be about like you know how to assess safety ratings. So before like you know we go to the most important part about how to assess, uh, a bulk of this talk is going to talk about why this is a very difficult problem to solve. At so um, end goal, you're n I'm not going to have like one framework, one definitive answer. It's just going to be a proposal. So what are the challenges? Uh, first off, you cannot escape adversarial machine learning. There's no vendor who can claim that, uh, you know, my machine learning system is adversarial ML free because it's ubiquitous among all ML paradigms. Whether you take supervised learning, uh, whether you take like reinforcement learning, adversarial examples are just a force of nature. Uh, and uh, Paper Knot kind of figured out that adversarial examples are also transferable. So if you have a, a system, say a logistic regression system, and you train on that, uh, it's pretty much those attacks are transferable to say decision trees as well. So not only um, are you kind of like guaranteed, but it's also transferable. Skegity in like 2016 said that, hey, it's not only transferable, but even if you have two completely different data sets, you will still have like adversarial machine learning. So you're pretty much caught in like a triple whammy at this point. Um, and the second challenge is um, verifying if an algorithm is safe is practically difficult. In, in fact, like um, it's an NP, comp uh, it's computationally intractable. That was like one of the stellar results that we got this year that even if you can, it might be theoretically possible, but computationally it's impossible because of limited training data. And the, the biggest kicker is it's an NP complete problem, especially in the context of uh, deep neural nets, which is like really big popular right now. So if somebody, you know, if, you, if somebody gives you a deep neural net and if they ask you to verify a property about it, hey, is it safe? It's an NP complete problem. There's no like, uh, exact, you can come up with a solution, but it's very, in polynomial time, I can't really verify it. I mean, there's been some good news. I don't want to like damper the whole system. You can get some sort of upper bounds, some confidence bounds, but this work is super nascent um, at, this, um, at this point. The third challenge is, uh, you know, completely safe ML systems can only occur, uh, you know, if you have a non-zero tester. So just to like, you know, uh, what this statement means is if you, when you train your machine learning systems, you get like 
two, you know, two things that you want to really care about. Like, how does it perform in the training set, and how does it perform in the test set? And even if you get like a machine learning system that performs really well on a training test, uh, on a training data, there's no guarantee it's going to perform well on a test data. So imagine that you built like a, it's not, oh, it's not me, thank you. Yeah, there's no music as part of this presentation. Uh, so um, the only way, uh, one of the insights that two recent papers had is, the only way that you can kind of assume like a system is safe is if it has non-zero test error. And non-zero test error is really not possible. We'll, we'll see why. Uh, this is kind of like a relation. It's called, um, it's called a VC bound. It bounds your test error as like, you know, your training error and as a function of something called a VC, uh, VC bound. We won't go into that. But just like, you know, keep in mind that test error is kind of like proportional to some, you know, uh, some additive nature of VCs. The problem is these bounds are really loose. Like if you have a linear classifier, it is like, you know, and if you have like a million features, you know, your VC bound is kind of like million plus one. So if you think, if you go back here and you put like a million, you know, the bound is really loose. And for some learners, it's kind of infinity. So imagine like, you know, you've always wanted as a kid to put an infinity in an equation. Now is your, now is your time. So it's really, these bounds are very loose and they're, Getting like a zero test error is impossible, which means that it has big safety implications. And this being DEF CON, you know, I found this like cool, oh, oh, now you can't see the picture, but this is Vapnik, who kind of like, you know, um, found the VC bound. And it, if you could read it, it says, all your bays are belong to us, but bays spelled with a Y, like Bayesian learning, like nerds, right? So, so, um, of course, there's a lot of like defenses that have been published in archive, you know, scores and scores of those. Uh, but there is no single defense, unfortunately, from a machine learning perspective that you can use to protect yourself against attackers. Um, there's a great paper, which actually I think won the best paper at ICLR, a top-notch machine learning conf academic conference. What the paper showed was like, out of the, they took like the nine defenses that were published as part of the conference and they broke seven of them. Uh, so it's very easy, um, you know, to kind of like get over these defenses. Um, Goodfellow is kind of like the father of this field at this point, kind of like ranked some of these defenses along certain axes, and we'll, we'll see that a little bit. The next thing is like the next big challenge of constructing a framework and, uh, you know, guaranteeing safety is there's a big tension between adversarial examples and interpretability. How many of you know what GDPR is? Okay, perfect. You'd have all gotten those annoying emails, right? Because if a company didn't, then awesome. You know, they're probably going to get slapped big fines. So one of the things that GDPR uh, articles say is that they want to support uh, explanation. So you know, you want, um, which means like some sort of like explainability should be in your model. So this way, if your mortgage get if your mortgage gets denied, you know, you know exactly why it's been denied if it's, there's a machine learning system behind it. So a lot of people are now using like um, uh, explainable models as you know, part of, you know, to get like uh, explainability. And the, the crux of most explainable models is that they're linear learners. And linear learners are extremely vulnerable to tampering. So if you have this tension where like you want to bring explainability, so you use linear models, and if you use linear ML models, you're, you know, you kind of have this adversarial tampering. So this is kind of like a big tension, just like how we face in security fields where we have a tension between usability and security as well. And finally, like ML safety is a lot more about adversarial tampering. Um, Justin Gilmer, who wrote a um, paper this time about like what it means to do adversarial example in real world, gave, gave this uh, anecdote. If you think of like, you know, the big, poster child for uh, adversarial examples is autonomous cars. You know, hey, what if, you know, somebody puts a sticker on my stop sign and now a stop sign is now like recognized as speed limit. Well, they said, hey, let's be more realistic here. What if there's no stop sign in the beginning in the first place? What if a stop sign gets like knocked over by a gust of wind? What if like a guy is wearing a stop sign and like stop sign t-shirt and walking on the road? Does that mean the car is going to just come to a halt? 
So a lot of these things, uh, in a practical sense, kind of dictate, which is kind of like bigger than the scope of you know training or testing within like a dev machine under your box. So these are kind of like the challenges at this point. You know, you cannot escape attacks. There is no single defense, um, and it's very it's extremely difficult to verify the security properties. And really, you know, the safety is like more than one predominant technique. Existential dread. Let's all crawl under a bed and now like, you know, wait for the doom to get over. But you guys are the perfect audience. Like in a security field, we face this every single time. Like everything that is, makes ML systems kind of insecure is what we face in a security setting on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and we tackle this risk, we tackle this by minimizing risk, right? You know, uh, this is just one framework, like, you know, the dread framework of, like, you know, you try to see how much an attacker can cause damage. You know, how hard is it for an attacker to kind of reproduce, uh, other attackers to kind of reproduce it? Are you always worrying about, like, APT, or is it going to can take a strip kitty can bring your system down? Uh, how, how easy is it for somebody to discover uh, this particular vulnerability? So with that in mind, like, you know, here's like one possible framework that, you know, uh, that just came to my mind is the goal is to kind of score the kind of attackers, um, score different parts of like your ML pipeline. So the first thing is like you want to score the attacker's capability. Hey, um, does the attacker have access to my architecture and training data is very different from like if the attacker can just like query my API. So you want to have two different, like, you know, just like how you would calculate a dread score, you want to have a score for that. Um, hey, what are, like, you know, some of the possible attacks? You know, is it, like, a white box attacks, or is it, like, you know, black box attacks with some sort of limited querying? Uh, and have some, you know, a score for defense. Kind of rank them in some aspect. If your uh, AI, if your ML engineer is just using, like, weight DK as a defense technique, it's really, you're really not in a good position. Uh, whereas, you know, if they're using some sort of, if they're using uh, strong uh, tr adversarial training with strong attacks, or they're doing something with logit pairing, you're probably in a better place. So, th so the, the same framework that you use in the context of s assessing security risk, making an argument that you want to do the same thing for ML risk. And once you get that, you can kind of like, you know, from a regulatory perspective, it becomes a very easy conversation. Let's assume that you get a score uh, at the end of it, right? Hey, then you can make a claim that all ML, you know, if there's a medical device that uses machine learning, that must have a safety rating of nine or above. Or, you know, if you're using like military grade drones uh, versus civilian grade drones should have like different levels of safety ratings. But of course, there's like a lot of open questions, right? We saw like the challenges. We saw like one possible framework. Like who is going to certify, you know, um, that an ML system is safe? Um, if you go to like a CDC or like an, is there going to be like a FAA that takes care of the safety of airplanes? Who's going to take care of the safety of like ML systems, especially that they're so pervasive? Ryan Kahlo kind of argues for, uh, I mean, mentions like a federal, Robotics Commission, uh, and that that idea is not too far fetched. Like you know, given the fact that ML is so pervasive, uh, we still don't know what the process of certifying it looks like. If anybody has been through like uh, the GDPR process, you kind of know how an immense amount of burden is put on uh, folks to kind of like get that GDPR safe systems. And how do you ensure verifiability? If somebody you know, if you go to uh, a custom, if you buy a service from a service provider and they say that our machine learning is safe and we have a safety rating of X, how do you verify that the safety rating is still the same? And, and there are also like very practical questions, right? When do you calculate the safety ratings? Do you calculate it every day? Every time you push a feature? Well, tough luck because we're all now in the DevOps world and we're all like, you know, shipping features every single day. So does that mean every time somebody touches code, do you calculate this ML safety rating? A lot of the mechanics of ML safety has not been nailed yet. So lots of open questions, and if you have ideas, I'd love to hear more about it. So that kind of like brings our first half of the talk, you know, to a kind of a close. Uh, we'll quickly kind of like look at, you know, what are the legal underpinnings of machine learning safety. 
And we're going to look at it from the lens of internet safety. Just because, like, you know, um, internet and machine learning seem to have a lot in common. Like, you know, both are transformative technologies. Nobody could have imagined that people can send cat pictures when they had DARPA put out DARPAnet. Um, and just like how like machine learning today is used for very similar purposes, you also have the idea of like transforming it from so many different angles. And Jonathan Zetrain called internet a generative technology, which means that it has the capacity uh, to produce new content for broad and varied audience. And the same thing is with machine learning. Yesterday there was this amazing demo of creating music with code. Um, from, from this DJ, which I thought was very interesting, really shows uh, the power of machine learning and the internet. And both have like great degrees of instability. You know, uh, in the loft talk, they said that how you could take the internet in 30 minutes or less. And the same thing was with the machine learning. Hang Lee said how he was basic, very easily oh, able to oh, open a shell uh, in like a top like uh, image recognition system in very short period of time. And from a legal aspect, uh, we, you know, it makes sense to look at uh, ML in the ends of internet just because of precedent. And precedent is really, really uh, core to common law legal system, right? Uh, my favorite quote is, uh, you know, in one of the uh, verdicts from like Vasquez and Hillary, they said that you, we, we rely, they, the court really relies on precedent because it establishes a bedrock of principles as opposed to some individuals like you know making up law as they go, um, and and the and the cases that got decided in like 1997 is still having an effect today in the internet. For instance, like in Reno versus ACLU is essentially why you can have profane content on the internet because on the legal basis of like uh, freedom of uh, the First Amendment. And in 2018, there was a case Packingham versus North Carolina where North Carolina said you know. Sex offenders do not have the ability, should not be on social media anymore. But the court said no on a unanimous decision. And they cited Reno as one of their legal precedents. And really, precedents do not get overturned by the court so easily. Um, they, work, they wait for societal changes. So really looking at it from the lens of internet, internet safety makes a lot of sense. And why, and, why did, and why are we doing this from a legal perspective? So imagine like poisoning attacks and machine learning. Poisoning attacks uh, are essentially when uh, an attacker can send chaff data to your machine learning system with the uh, goal of subverting it. So to either misclassify it or, you know, or even completely change the goal. A relevant cyber law case could be like CompuServe v. Cyber Promotions. So this was a case in 1997. So the, um, the basic gist was CompuServe was an ISP and Cyber Promotions with a direct marketing email. So, uh, and they were basically sending spam via CompuServe. And CompuServe customers were obviously like super pissed off. They were like, hey man, like you guys need to stop doing this because my customers are gonna bail else. And Cyber Promotion says, hey no, that's kind of like, you know, you're a common carrier, this is our First Amendment. And the court basically said, no, it's not the case. And they established precedents that even on a non-electronic, I mean, even for an electronic property, you can pretty much have like trespassing. And this might be possible, this might be relevant for poisoning attacks when an attacker is sending like uh, spam images to kind of uh, derail your machine learning system. Or let's think of liability, right? Imagine that, you know, you go to a scenario where you, you know, you get some sort of like uh, a robotic system to detect art forgery. Like, you know, you're expecting this top-notch like ML system to detect forgery, but you basically get a lemon. And now you lost a bunch of money because instead of Picasso, you've gotten some other like weird art student painting. Now, can you take the person who, uh, who, set, who sold you this machine learning system, who said that it can like identify fake art to court? Because you, suf you suffered like millions of dollars in damage. And it's a very interesting system because liability in the context of machine learning safety is, is still uh, a nascent system. And a relevant cyber law case is Transcorp v. Uh, IBM. So essentially Transcorp America bought like um, a lot of equipment back in 1994 from IBM. And those disks failed. And they suffered 
economic loss. So obviously TCA sued IBM for economic loss. And in the initial, and this is like back when the internet was very nascent, and the court basically tried to limit the liability because the courts basically said, you can sue them for contractual, um, you know, for, rene for them reneging on the contract, but you cannot sue them on the basis of economic loss. You cannot sue them for all the money that you lost. And it's kind of crazy because today when we buy computers and say your, your, ex um, your OS failed and you lost all your documents, we do not think of going and suing our computer, um, you know, the, comp the people who wrote the OS for economic loss because we kind of implicitly assume computer systems are faulty. And today, you know, we kind of learned that machine learning systems can be attacked and machine learning systems can be implicitly faulty. So because of the changing landscape, it is very much possible that the courts will also try to limit the liability because in order to foster innovation. I mean, there's a big exception. Like, if you got, you know, if there was a drone that came in, you know, chopped your hand off, there might be, you know, this, this probably doesn't apply. But here's a very interesting thing that Ryan Kahlo uh, pointed out. If you have the scenario wherein there was a bodily harm caused by, you know, um, uh, you know, like a machine learning system that used open source software, what do you do then? Who do you assign proximate cost to? The, the people who built the drones uh, or you know, the thousands of developers who contributed code to the open source systems. And these are again like very um, not easy questions uh, to answer. Oh, this by the way, CAFE is like, uh, if you're wondering why this was uh, an open source symbol, CAFE is a very popular like image recognition like system right there. So yeah, uh, to kind of like you know, talk, wrap up with the open questions here. Like, when an ML system breaks down, how do you get relief? Like, were the damages foreseeable? Do you, go, do you go after the company that made the product, the open source toolkit the company used, or if the company kind of hosted it on a different service, a service provider, or the researchers who kind of like, whose algorithm the computer used? And all of these are important questions for answers we do not really know because there is no case that's been tested so far. So to wrap up, um, if you were to think of like all the countries, you know, there's been a spate of them releasing AI strategy so far, like you know, and these are some of the handful of company uh, countries who have you know pretty much put AI safety and privacy as a big strategy, you know, in the in their vision. Of course, you might see our red, white, and blue is not here. And that's because we do not have one yet. The US's approach to machine learning safety has been very different. Us being like us, our focus is a lot on autonomous weapons. Um, and the Obama administration back in the 2016 created like, you know, the US Artificial Intelligence R&D Task Force. They produced two reports um, and recommendations. Obviously, with, uh, take it back, with this new administration, they disbanded the task force and kind of like, you know, pushed those reports aside. And if you're wondering where we are, um, they created like a select committee of which it's co-chaired by, wait for it, our president, <laughs> and a bunch of other people. So we don't, uh, the, uh, very recently there was a bill uh, called the Future of Cyber uh, Artificial Intelligence Act uh, for, that's been proposed. And nowhere are we, uh, as Congress even mentioned about AI safety. So we're not really in a great place uh, in terms of like uh, even thinking about this problem yet. And it's a shame because a lot of the companies have taken this uh, on themselves to kind of define standards uh, and try to get ahead of the curve. So to kind of conclude, um, you know, safety frameworks are super critical for machine learning systems. Um, and that will help us like create robust standards and certifications that we can use uh, to our advantage, whether to convince customers or to add value. Um, and this instead will help us get meaningful relief should there be or when there is a case that involves uh, ML safety. And with that, like you know, 
uh, I want to end with these things. The court is still grappling with the effects of internet. This was, a, this was Justice Anthony Kennedy in Packingham v. North Carolina in 2018. And he said that the forces and directions of the internet are so new, so protean, and so far-reaching that courts must be conscious of what they say today might be obsolete tomorrow. And they're talking about internet, which was started in the 1980s. And think about like a, a feel like machine learning. Um, and what effects and how the legal system is going to handle it. And this is a big open question. And, and if I were to wear my engineer hat on, you know, uh, Ken Thompson, you know, a Turing Prize award winner, you know, asked this question, you know, to what extent, like, you know, should you trust a statement that a program is free from Trojan horses? And the answer is like, you can't. You can't trust any code that you did not write yourself. And that's shocking, but think of like you know how ML is being viewed. Uh, Karpathy, you know, one of uh, OpenAI's director uh, for machine learning, and probably a big titan in this field, compared machine learning as software 2.0. You know that machines will now be able to write better programs than humans. And I'm going to end with this unsettling note, which is how much are you going to be trusting ML models that we did not build ourselves? And that's pretty much, I feel, is going to define the field in the next coming years. So that's about it.